I'm Dr. Swanee Jett, and I've had a passion for public health for over 30 years. Now, I'm in a position to affect change. And these are the critical conversations about health and our community with people who can help me make those changes. Good morning, welcome to CEO of Live Talks. My name is Dr. Swanee Jett. Today I have a great friend with me, Dr. Ricky Jones. And we're gonna to begin to get into a little bit of conversation. All right. Welcome to the set. My brother, thank you, man. It's so good to I'm so time good, with you. you. And you, you looking good, man. Oh, no, you looking good. You looking good. <laughs> I, I'm just gonna say this one thing before I jump off. Somebody saw me wearing a bow tie, uh -huh. right? And they started saying, you got a bean pie. And I said, maybe you have forgotten that bow ties mean you're a scholar. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the nation of Islam. So let's not do that. And I'm going to continue to wear a bow tie until people recognize that. And I like bean pies. Yeah, I like them. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Jim Muhammad and all the in the city. You know? So, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about your upbringing, you know? Um, and how did you grow up? You know, man, I, I grew up a little bit different. You know, when people see us with, you know, doctorates and in higher ed and, and CEOs like you, they think we were born that way. That That's not my background. Um, my mother was 15 years old when she had me. First time she had sex, she got pregnant. And so obviously a 15 year old is not really prepared to be a parent. And my grandmother ended up raising me in the housing projects in Atlanta. You know, I'm an Atlanta kid. But my grandmother was from rural Georgia, was born in 1933, um, died in 2009, and she was functionally illiterate. She, she wasn't able to read very well. Mm -hmm. So I didn't meet my father until I was in my mid thirties. So I grew up a little tough, you know, it was basically me and my grandmother. And my grandmother sacrificed a lot for me. Okay. And that, uh, so without that woman, I don't know what would have happened to me. Okay. So I, did, I certainly didn't have a silver spoon. So that's a good good question I'm gonna lead into. So meet your dad in your 30s. Yeah. Tell us about that experience. Man, we could talk the, the whole show about that. Um, you know, thankfully, I'm blessed that uh, my father and I have a, a pretty good relationship now. Um, but there are psychological issues that come with spending so much time in your life, not knowing where you come from. Mm -hmm. Like you're half a person because if your father can walk up and spit on you and you don't even know who he is, you know, that's that's problematic. So um, there was a lot of shame in it. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a point in my life where I would even tell people my father was dead okay. because I was too ashamed to tell him I didn't know who he was. Um, so, you know, that that's a long story, a uh, complicated one. Um, but but yeah, that, that wasn't a, a, a great way to grow up. So, you know, in society today, you see a lot of fathers being absent. What is the impact on society? And let's delve into what we're noticing in Louisville. I think first off for me, it's very, very important to put that into some historical context mm -hmm. because this country has you know, for a very, very long time, attack black families. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it like to be in an enslaved situation mm -hmm. when one human being, because of the color of their skin, can walk into your family and just take your husband, sell them off, mm -hmm. take your wife, sell her off, take your children, sell them off. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there, there are consequences to that. Mm -hmm. And so people, I'm, I'm a fan of black men Mm -hmm. And I think that we are one of the most persecuted single groups in the country. And so people don't want to put context to what is going on with us. So, but unfortunately, as a result of that, you know, we do have some breaks in our families and we have breaks in fatherhood mm -hmm. that we have to address. But also I'll say this, and you know this, the black family has also adjusted People talk about this adaptive vitality model of mm -hmm. the black family. Mm -hmm. So just because fathers may not be around, you know, you got uncles and cousins, you know, brothers down the street play cousins, everybody who, mm -hmm. who, who pitch in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I say that and last I say this intentionally, 
there are a whole lot of black men out here who are doing their level best to be good fathers. They are present. They may not be in ideal situations, even when they may not be in a relationship with the mother of their children. They still fighting like dogs to be good fathers. So I say shouts to those brothers because I don't think they're, they're talked about enough. And what I have seen, lived experience, systematically, um, African-American men have been demonized. Um, the structure of the home, the breakup started to occur in the 60s during the civil rights movement. <clears throat> it was perpetrated through welfare, which we know African-American men, if you had a kid, could not come around the woman if she received food stamps. And then it carried on through the penal system. And, and now we're at a point in society where I have noticed in boardrooms, there's a lack of African-American men. <laughs> I have noticed in key leadership positions, there's a lack of African-American men. That is also a systematic approach because we're deemed as a threat. So from your perspective, let's talk about what has happened in terms of demonizing. And I remember a while back, you had a conversation with Coach Wade Houston, which we don't celebrate enough in terms of his accomplishments. Let's, let's unpackage that. You know, what do you think about that? Well, where do you start, man? You know, I do think that, that black men are demonized, have been demonized for a very, very long time. If you talk about professional spaces, and look, let's, let's be clear, what we're really talking about is white supremacy. Correct. Um, and, on a lot of levels, and people are afraid to Correct. talk about that. But when I talk about white supremacy, I'm not talking about it in these elementary cartoonish terms, like the Ku Klux Klan marching around, mm -hmm. or you know, some white nationalists marching around in Charlottesville talking about Jews will not replace us. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking about white supremacy, I'm talking about the, the ideology of a single group of people because of the color of their skin, feeling that they, they feel like they're the only ones who have the right to think, know, and decide. Mm -hmm. The practice of redlining in Louisville began in the 1930s with the creation of maps for banks with color-coded neighborhoods based on safety. This episode is sponsored by Black Jockey's Lounge, an upscale, fun, and unique restaurant and bar in the heart of downtown Louisville, 630 South 4th Street. Visit blackjockeyslounge.com. Happy holidays to everyone. Please remember to continue to make sure that you're healthy and happy during these holiday seasons. Stop by to see us at Park Duval Community Health Center. We give flu shots. We also do your COVID vaccines and just general wellness checkups. We look forward to seeing you. My Park Duval Community Health Center is right here. Communities in our name. My Park Duval Community Health Center is right here. You're always on time. Because we serve the community. My Park Duval Community Health Center is right here. Park Duval Community Health Center, providing quality health care, one person, one family, one neighborhood at a time. Are you a healthcare professional considering new opportunities? Are you just new to the market? Or are you someone just looking for a change? Go to pdchc.org today and check out our many career options. Why not serve your community? Hola, eh, mi nombre es Miguel, eh, asistente médico en la clínica Parduval Community Health Center, departamento de adulto. Quiero desearle a todos nuestros eh, pacientes de habla hispana una feliz eh, Navidad. Y en estos tiempos de... Eh, de COVID, de influenza. So, por favor, eh, necesitamos que tenga su vacuna del COVID y la vacuna de la influenza. Es muy importante para mantenernos sanos todos. Gracias. 
This episode is sponsored by Black Jockey's Lounge, an upscale, fun, and unique restaurant and bar in the heart of downtown Louisville, 630 South 4th Street. Visit blackjockeyslounge.com. Well, to be honest with you, Louisville is what we call a converted, uh, of covert racism. It's not blatant, it's more covert than anything. If we can get past the race issue and, and treat everybody equal, Louisville will be an awfully fine city. As a consequence of redlining, many blacks in Louisville were denied access to home loans based on where their homes were located. So, from your perspective, let's talk about what has happened in terms of demonizing. And I remember a while back you had a conversation with Coach Wade Houston, which we don't celebrate enough in terms of his accomplishments. Let's, let's unpackage that. You know, what do you think about that? Well, where do you start, man? You know, I do think that, that black men are demonized, have been demonized for a very, very long time. If you talk about professional spaces, and look, let's, let's be clear, what we're really talking about is white supremacy. Correct. Um, and, on a lot of levels, and people are afraid to Correct. talk about that. But when I talk about white supremacy, I'm not talking about it in these elementary cartoonish terms, like the Ku Klux Klan marching around, or you know, some white nationalists marching around in Charlottesville talking about Jews will not replace us. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking about white supremacy, I'm talking about the, the ideology of a single group of people because of the color of their skin, feeling that they, they feel like they're the only ones who have the right to think, know, and decide. Mm -hmm. So they become the terminal decision makers in almost every space. And we as black professional men have to navigate those spaces. But when decisions are made about who's going to be in, in that boardroom, who's going to be in the C-suite, who's going to be in leadership positions, if there are any leadership positions set aside for black people, we're not the ones making those decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I hear a lot people say, well, you know, you just got to be at the table. Hmm. That means nothing to me. You got to be right? empowered. Well, to make even, decisions. Even, even, even different, Brother Swanee, you could put a black person at the table. Right. But if that black person that you put at that table is saying the same thing that the people who believe in white supremacist paradigms have been saying for the last 50 years, then what does it matter that that person is at the table? Correct. Clarence Thomas is going to reaffirm what you're saying. Herschel Walker is going to reaffirm what you're saying. Candace Owens is going to reaffirm what you're saying. So right. every space, and those are extreme examples, right. but every space in effect becomes the behavior it rewards. And so when you talk about Louisville or other places, you see it, I see it. One, a lot of times black men are going to be frozen out of any space because we are, fear, we are feared. Right. If black men or black people, period, are allowed into those spaces, they're usually more meek, quiet, mm -hmm. milk toast, not going to rock the boat. Right. But nobody's going to be put there who really wants some type of change. If you're not a revolutionary as, as a black person, I say you're insane. Right. Right? And people get afraid, mm -hmm. you know, because of that word. But a revolutionary is just somebody who wants change. And people and if, are scared of change. And yeah, they talk about change, but they don't really want change. Right. And so if you're black and you're a revolutionary, or if you're black and you're not a revolutionary, I think something is wrong with you. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Um, again, you know, I can't say it enough. Spaces become the behavior they reward. So if you reward silence, mm -hmm. you reward cowardice, eventually you're going to be a, a cowardly, quiet space mm -hmm. that is not going to change. And unfortunately, I think that's what we get a lot in the black community in Louisville. So let me dial in a little bit <clears throat> because, you know, we're at a critical point in Louisville history um, after the murder of Breonna Taylor. What change is occurring in Louisville and what actually needs to occur over the next few years? <laughs> That's a loaded question, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that those of us who actually study the history of social movements, race, and protest and politics. Politics, uh, Harold Laswell, a great political scientist, gave a good definition of politics. It's the process that decides who gets what, when, where, and how. Right. 
that's not just about street protest. Street protest is a phase right. in a change movement. Mm -hmm. The question that I was asking from the beginning is what are we going to do to change the structural power dynamics in Louisville? So if you think about it on that level, very little to nothing has changed since the, the death of Breonna Taylor to change the racial structural power dynamics in the right. city. And I don't see that change on the horizon because you do not have a collective black push for that change to happen. And maybe they don't even understand right. um, that, that, that need. The interesting point, because I always say it's, 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 it's good to protest. I'm, yep. And I'm not knocking protest. You gotta have a formula for change. Yeah. And people say, let's go vote. But <laughs> we lost something when Louisville merged. Yeah. So, I'll talk about that. It's interesting that you bring that up, which means you have some historical political memory about that situation. So. You, Right around the turn of the century, but later there was a push to, to merge the city and the county. I was against it. I came here in 1996, I think you beat me. 95. Here by a year. And my thought was, and you gotta understand my context. Right. I grew up in Atlanta. We had a black mayor in Atlanta since 1973, Morehouse man, yes, you know, yes, uh, yes. Mayor Jackson. I'm a Morehouse man. Yes, so I know, I'm big I know. on political power because right. I think that that's how you make decisions. Right. My message to black people in Louisville was not a single black person in this city should vote for merger. Right. And they asked why. You know, and I'm like, look, in the city proper, your population is right at a third, a little bit more than a third. I think it was 34, 35 yeah. percent of the city proper. When you merge the city and county, you're going to cut your voting strength in half to about 17, 18 percent. No reasonable people just give away their voting strength right. like that. And my thought was, this will set up a situation where you will not have a black mayor for the foreseeable future. And some people will, will certainly say, well, why are you so worried about race? Because America's worried about race. Right. I'm worried about black people. I'm not a DEI person. I want to be clear about that. I don't, you know, I work on anti-black racism. That's right. what I work on. So I'm concerned about the fortunes of black people because they're so persecuted and there's so few people to speak up for them and understand the structures that are aligned against them. And so my thought is you, you want to have the voting strength where you eventually can dictate whether or not you have a black mayor. So it hasn't happened. Currently, Louisville is one of two of the 50th largest cities in this country to not have ever elected a woman, Hispanic, or black mayor. In the 2020 general election, Jefferson County had one central polling station as a result of COVID. Voters in Louisville's West End were disenfranchised as a result of poor communication about voting, location, and lack of transportation. This episode is sponsored by Black Jockey's Lounge, an upscale, fun, and unique restaurant and bar in the heart of downtown Louisville, 630 South 4th Street. Visit blackjockeyslounge.com. to take a sneak peek at the kitchen, see what Chef is whipping up for our special today. Chef Clayton, what do you have for us? Hey, uh, we got a uh, special, we're doing a shrimp and fried grits. Uh, so we got our grit cake and uh, we're frying them. Thank you so much, Chef. I bet whoever is getting this plate is going to be excellent day satisfied. Hi, my name is Latasha Wilson. I work at Park Duval Behavior Health on 3015 Wilson Avenue. And we understand that holidays can be um, overwhelming and depressing for you. If you need any care or anything from us, please feel free to stop by and see us at Park Duval. We look forward to seeing you and happy holidays to you and your family from our family at Park Duval Community Health Center. It's Brittany from Park Duval Community Health Center Pharmacy. We wanted to wish you a happy holidays from all of your pharmacy team. For amended hours during the holidays, please check our Facebook page.
elect a mayor, uh, a minority or a female? I would hope so. I mean, I think I think the Lexington and Louisville have both become pretty diverse. I mean, Lexington, obviously, with our former mayor Gray, uh, was you know openly gay and uh, was the minority for sure. And I think he did very well in Lexington. And I would hope that Louisville would be as open-minded. In the 2020 general election, Jefferson County disregarded more than 8,000 votes deemed spoiled and therefore uncounted. That number has been challenged, with some experts claiming it to be much higher. All right, so uh, the city of Louisville, do you ever foresee it uh, electing a woman or a minority candidate as mayor? I believe it will. Um, I believe they will one day, you know. Why is that? Because it is, it's going on in America right now, and Louisville's just a little bit behind, and they are catching up to speed. You know, I've been here for five years. You know, I'm from New York City, and I've seen a lot of change and diversity going on in here. And some people will, will certainly say, well, why are you so worried about race? Because America's worried about race. Right. I'm worried about black people. I'm not a DEI person. I want right. to be clear about that. I don't, you know, I work on anti-black racism. That's right. what I work on. So I'm concerned about the fortunes of black people because they're so persecuted and there's so few people to speak up for them and understand the structures that are aligned against them. And so my thought is you, you want to have the voting strength where you eventually can dictate whether or not you have a black mayor. So it hasn't happened. Currently, Louisville is one of two of the 50th largest cities in this country to not have ever elected a woman, Hispanic, or black mayor. Mm. One of two of the largest 50th cities. That is not that's a not good. good thing. That's not good. So that's why I was against merger, and I, I think that that we gave away our power. Right. Yeah, we, we, we gave away our power. Well, we helped to give away well, yeah, our of power. Of course, yes. of course. Because there were certainly other people who voted voted for a merger. Which is why we still, I've been here since 95, and I have not seen any changes from 9th Street leading to the West End. Yeah. And maybe it's because we don't have the political muster to really make change. Yeah. But people, I think Louisville's it. I'm not saying that Louisville is in a dangerous place, and I think it's been in a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. The culture is such that um, black folk are stuck in this cycle of begging for white philanthropy, right. begging for white mercy, begging for white understanding, and too polite to, to call that what it is. Mm -hmm. And until there's some real muscle behind those demands, as, as Frederick Douglass said, Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and never will. Um, so people need to know their history and they need to know, um, you know, you, you gotta have a revolutionary mentality. Right. Now, my question to, to, to Louis Villians, even black Louis Villians who, right. who would look at revolutionary thinkers with a little bit of angst and trepidation, see them as troublemakers, what happens when your revolutionaries give up on you and leave? Right. You're right. right. Now, I have noticed and I saw a change in Atlanta um, in the late 80s. Um, more African Americans to move there. The dynamics of the city changed. The political landscape changed. Now what I'm noticing, and you brought up DEI, we have a lot of people being hired in these key positions. Um, and it's a, it's a fixture, but what can they really do to make change? I mean, because I always talk about matrix substance, but what do you think? Or what, what is your call to action for them? Uh, I think. Tune in next week for more of Dr. Jet's interview with Dr. Ricky Jones. population lives in Jefferson County.
This episode is sponsored by Black Jockey's Lounge, an upscale, fun, and unique restaurant and bar in the heart of downtown Louisville, 630 South 4th Street. Visit blackjockeyslounge.com. My Park Duval Community Health Center is right here. Communities in our name. My Park Duval Community Health Center is right here. You're always on time. Because we serve the community. My Park Duval Community Health Center is right here. Park Duval Community Health Center, providing quality health care, one person, one family, one neighborhood at a time. My name is Zakia Williams. I am the Director of Outreach and Enrollment. Currently, open enrollment is going on to January the 15th of 2023. If you do not currently have health insurance, please come and see us here at Park Duval Community Health Center in room 204. Once again, if you do not have health insurance, please come and see us here at Park Duval Community Health Center. This episode is sponsored by Black Jockey's Lounge, an upscale, fun, and unique restaurant and bar in the heart of downtown Louisville, 630 South 4th Street. Visit blackjockeyslounge.com. <laughs> 